Is it possible to completely stop facial and skin aging from happening in the first place? Well, that's what prejuvenation is all about, and I'm gonna let you know my thoughts and cover the topic in great detail. So definitely stay tuned. It's a fascinating discussion. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Amir Karam, board certified facial plastic surgeon and founder and creator of Karam MD Skin. I specialize in facial rejuvenation, which basically means I help people look as young as they feel. And on today's episode of Skin School, we're gonna talk about this fascinating and ever-growing concept called prejuvenation and what it really means and what is it capable of achieving when it comes to preventing facial and skin aging from happening in the first place. Exciting, exciting topic, and I think one that for you know, many of us, it's, it's gonna be enlightening. I think it's also something that if we can share with people who are in their 20s and 30s, who are being very, very mindful at this age of how to prevent their face from aging in the first place, they're gonna find this topic to be super, super interesting and valuable as well. So let's break it down. So what's the notion of prejuvenation? So basically, everything else in medicine, we've always been, you know, let the disease happen, then let's go diagnose the disease, and then let's go treat it. I mean, that, that's kind of old school, old school mentality completely. How much better would it be to basically prevent the disease from happening in the first place, right? I mean, never get sick, never have a, have a problem. Well, that's probably the future of clinical medicine, one day we'll be able to test our DNA and test our, our genome and be able to boom, we can see what's coming and then be able to do some kind of actionable you know, step to, to toward a disease from ever even happening in the first place. We're not there yet when it comes to medicine. But are we there with skin and facial rejuvenation? Because we all know aging sucks. Let's just face it. Anyone who's above the age of late 40s and early 50s and beyond looks at themselves and says, what in the world, how is this happening? I don't even look like myself anymore. Because those of you who are watching this and you're in your 20s and 30s, you pretty much, you look just like you feel. You should be loving the way you look and feel. And going forward, you want to preserve this as long as possible because the natural aging process, normally speaking, starts going into full effect post-menopause in the 50s and really kind of creates a situation where there's a massive gap between the way we see ourselves and the way we actually look. And that becomes discerning and bothersome and really is the whole motivation and inspiration behind anyone who seeks any type of facial rejuvenation and skin rejuvenation procedure in the first place. That's what they want is to look as young as they feel. Now, we're gonna back up for a second. So we said normal conventional medicine, get sick, diagnose, then treat. Normal facial rejuvenation approaches have been exactly that. Wait till somebody is fully aged, shows full blown signs of aging, and then go in there, and back in my residency days, we, we call it the blue plate special, which was a brow lift, upper and lower eyelid, lift, facelift and a neck lift. Boom, that's like what an aging face would get to restore their, their uh, youthful look. It didn't quite work that way. There was a lot of problems associated with, with that method, but bottom line was the co topic was you take a, you know, somebody who's in their 60s and you do a full-blown facelift and a, you know, all these other procedures, and at the end you get somebody who still probably looks like around their 60s, but looks tighter, right? That's like the historical facelift patient. Not a great outcome, not what something that people want because they're aging through time and they don't even wanna to get to the place where they quote unquote look old, right? So prejuvenation is the notion, can you stop and prevent the aging process? And I'm gonna share with you at the end, you know, my thoughts on it, what is possible and what's not possible given our current state of art. But along the way, I'm gonna share with you kind of like the basics. You know, what are some of the, the tools and methods that people are currently using to get themselves to a place where they don't see you know, their face age or the philosophy behind it to keep themselves from aging. And I'm gonna tell you what I think, whether those things work or don't work. And this is what it comes down to. As I'm gonna go through this list, I'm gonna include everything, but I also want you to start making, you know, a separation between things that are related to your skin and then things that are related to shape. Because those are two different things and the things that affect those two things are totally different. And facial shape is what we talk about when we talk about sagging jowls and neck laxity and heavy and hooded eyes and brows that come down and all that kind of stuff. Skin aging is things like lines and wrinkles, discoloration, thinning, dryness, crepiness, dullness, 
you know, roughness of the skin. Skin is shape, two sides of a coin that make us ultimately look as young as we feel. So what are the typical approaches that you're gonna hear about and see about, read about, and uh, get advice on what you should be doing? So generally speaking, prejuvenation focuses on people who are in their 20s and 30s. And in that group, sun protection is at the top of the pyramid. That's a key thing because 70 to 80% of the changes that affect the skin are accelerated by sun exposure. So sun is a big deal. So sunblock, sun protective clothing, just being very mindful about sun exposure is huge. The earlier you get started with that, the better. Next level comes down to use of active skincare ingredients. Things like retinols, vitamin C, um, niacinamide, hyaluronic acid, everything that is basically improving the production of collagen, decreasing the production of pigment, things like botanical uh, lighteners, etc., all of which are fundamentally keeping the skin from showing signs of aging. That's active skin care. That's what basically my trifecta falls under. That's what each one of these ingredients that I discussed fall under, but it's active skin care. Next level, use of Botox. Botox is touted and described and basically used both in terms of helping improve lines that exist, but also lines that haven't formed yet, but are in the process of forming. So for example, years ago, and I was still in residency and fellowship when this, this study was published, it was a twin study. They took a set of twins, identical twins, followed them through time, about I think it was 10 or 15 years, and they started at 30, and they followed them until about 50. And what they did was they treated one with Botox, you know, forehead lines, glabellar lines, crow's feet, and the other one didn't get any Botox. Followed them for, you know, whatever it was, 15 years or so, and looked at their faces. The one that used Botox didn't have any static lines, meaning lines that are there at rest, so wrinkles were reduced. The one who did not get Botox, unfortunately, had all the normal forehead lines and crow's feet eye lines, etc. So. It was a very important study for Botox in the sense that if you start early, you can prevent the lines from forming later on. So it's preventative. Botox has always been used in that capacity to keep dynamic lines, like the kind you raise your forehead and do this and smile and you get this, from having those lines transition to static lines, which means that they're there even when you don't express or smile, right? All right, so next level is the use of lasers, chemical peels, etc. The idea being that if you treat with lasers and chemical peels, that what you're doing is you're basically keeping your skin in better shape, etc. Keep the skin from aging and therefore, you know, free of any lines and wrinkles, etc. Some even go as far as to say if you do these things, you could even prevent the face from sagging by keeping the skin nice and tight. I'm gonna share with you my thoughts on that in a moment. Next level is the use of fillers. So we know that in our 30s, people start to lose volume in the face. And as you lose volume in the face, you basically want to replace that volume with filler. So the idea becomes like starting in your 30s, you're going in on a regular basis and you're using fillers regularly to not only replace volume, but to lift the face right, to lift the face. So I've had videos that we've shared the problems associated with that line of thinking where people are putting a lot of filler in their cheeks and a lot of filler in their jawline with the idea that they're gonna keep their face nice and high and tight. And as a result, sometimes you start to look a little weird, right, and we've all seen that look. And I've talked about a lot on these videos and social, I'll summarize and discuss that in a, in a moment. Next level are things like microneedling. Standard microneedling, basically little needles in the skin, stimulating collagen, keeping the skin from, from thinning over time. Then you've got energy devices, things like radio frequency microneedling, things like Morpheus 8, things like all therapy, things like Thermage that you've all heard about. Use those treatments regularly, and guess what? Your face won't sag. The, the Tissues will, the skin will keep nice and firm. The fascia and the deep tissues will stay nice and firm. This is the idea of prejuvenation. You know, you treat this, do it on a regular basis, every six months, every year, and your tissues will literally never sag, right? So this is, this is the, the, the next level. Next level above that is things like threads, using threads to tighten up the face and keep the face from aging, 
right? So these are all things that people, you know, are told to do to keep things from ever getting to a point when you start to see the combination changes associated with aging, which is affecting shape and affecting skin. And the fact is, we've been hearing more and more about this concept over the last several years. It's becoming very, I would say, trendy and very, um, you know, motivating and inspiring to approach this. And many people in their 20s and 30s are way more interested in preventing aging than say somebody like myself who's currently 50. When I was in my 20s and 30s, I don't think anyone even thought about preventing or, or you know, thwarting off the aging process. It just wasn't even a, a thing. So there's a lot more activity and motivation and information being brought that, which makes it extremely difficult for you as a consumer to recognize whether or not the things that are being told to you through marketing, social media, you know, experts and influencers, if these are actually the things that you should be doing, because it's never just one thing. It's always a combination of different things that you should be, you know, considering. And that combination could be very different from each individual and you as a unique individual may not always know what it is it's best for you. That's really the purpose of this talk is to help you through the, the maze and confusion and all the different you know, things that you hear about, give you the, the knowledge so you can make strong decisions for yourself going forward. I'm gonna clarify the entire spectrum for you in a very, very simple way. All right, so before we get into the specifics, let me just talk about the big picture risks that are associated with this. And this is really important to understand because if you're gonna go down this road, starting your 20s and 30s, and even your 40s, and you're trying to prevent stuff from happening, it's extremely important to understand what you're getting yourself into in the long run, right? Because there's a short run and then there's a long run. Of this entire list that I just brought up with you, there's some things that will have essentially no long-term negative consequence, and there's other things that are gonna get really complicated for you and create a lot of potential negative risks and problems for you in the long run. So I'm going to start with that, and then I'm gonna to talk to you about what would be, in my opinion, the ideal approach from a prejuvenation standpoint. Okay, I'm gonna go straight to fillers. Fillers are probably one of the most benign sounding types of treatments but also one of the most potentially high risk procedures. The paradigm that if I use fillers a little bit at a time, starting in my 30s or whatever, and then carry on, I'll never need a facelift. Really is really what it comes down to, or I'll push off the time that I need a facelift or some kind of surgery. Here's what ends up happening. These fillers are by nature foreign bodies. Foreign bodies means that they're not a natural part of our normal tissue, so when the enters our body, our body initiates a immune response and an inflammatory response, and it goes down the path of trying to get rid of the filler. The filler companies are extremely smart in the way they've composed these fillers so they can resist the, the immune system, resist the inflammatory process, and have an opportunity to last six months, a year, or longer. So there's this notion that every six months or so, the fillers are gonna go away, they're gonna degrade, and then you add a little bit more. But that very, nature of initiating an immune response and initiating a inflammatory response, that's causing damage to the tissues. And we didn't realize what that translated to until years later, I mean, I'm talking like 10, 15, 20 years later, when you start to see faces that have had fillers been placed on a regular basis, they start to look deformed. They start to look puffy in all the wrong places. They start to look exaggerated in certain areas, but what's unfortunate and the reality about it is it doesn't go away. It doesn't just simply go away. And why is because the inflammatory process that I just described leads to stimulation of collagen, which sounds like a good thing, but not when it's placed in areas that you don't necessarily want over production of collagen, like the cheeks, like the jawline, like, you know, the apples of the cheek, you know, or underneath your eyes. These are areas when you get too much collagen, they start to look simply weird. And when they don't go away, and then now there's a lot of MRI studies and different things like that that show the fillers truly do not go away with, with time, not, at least not 100% of them. So you end up with a situation where you've become deformed from the filler use since you started it so early, 10 years, 15 years of use, and now, what are you gonna do? There's no recourse with it. You put enzyme in it, it doesn't go away. You try to do you know, surgery for it, to, and then you start carving out, and it's a mess. 
It's a mess you don't want to get yourself into. So fillers are one of those things where I would just guard against the, the notion that you can use it regularly over time and be okay with it. I would say you really do need to use it literally just a little bit over time. And I mean a little bit over time. So if you're in this situation where you're putting some in your nasal labia fold, some in your cheeks, this and that, and then six months later going in and doing it again, you're heading down the wrong path. Let's talk about lasers and things like that. A little bit of laser is a good thing. Too much laser is not a good thing. Too much laser and chemical peels and doing that too often for the skin can break down the skin barrier, can create changes. And you've seen people, and it's less likely to see this now because the laser companies and the practitioners have learned a lot, but you've seen these people with these like porcelain white looking skin that look almost plastic. And that's from the use of deeper surfacing CO2 lasers, which were really popular for a while there. And they created just really kind of mannequin looking skin structures. Not a good thing to keep heating that skin over and over again and over and over again, and then the skin ends up remodeling in a, in a you know, sort of a negative way. So lasers are not a great thing to do on a long-term, regular basis if you're doing them too frequently and you're doing them aggressively. Same goes for chemical peels, deep, frequent, you can create problems with scarring, dis, dis, you know, discoloration, hypopigmentation, all these type of things. Now, one of probably the biggest culprit on, the, on this entire list is the notion of doing radio frequency or ultrasound based energy devices to try to prevent aging. So first of all, not only does it not prevent aging, but it also doesn't even help in a case where you actually have aging problems. The net effect, and I've done a, several videos on this topic as well, is it violates and starts to break down and affect some of the facial fat that's underneath the skin, which is such an important part of looking youthful and you want to keep that as long as possible. Trying to do these deep energy devices, like the ones I just mentioned, not only a waste of time and money, but also potentially harmful and counterproductive when it comes to preventing aging from happening. Threads are another one of those totally wasteful, you know, high risk procedures, high risk. When I say high risk, I'm telling you, it has a risk, but very little benefit. So anything that has a balance of having a risk and almost no benefit, you're putting yourself at a high risk relative to the benefit. I mean, facial surgery, facelift, vertical restore, all these things, they have a risk associated with them, but they have a massive benefit associated with them too. So the risk seems here, the benefit seems here, you're taking a, a good decision towards that because, you know, let's say a 1% risk for a, a big improvement is well worth it versus something that has a 1% risk and you also have a 1% improvement, there's not a lot of gain there and you're just taking a risk for nothing. So these, these things like threads and things like that, these are not going to help the cause. So psychologically, this is another risk. What ends up happening is when you're in your 20s and 30s or 40s or whatever and you're trying to prevent this from happening and you start to find yourself in a, in a situation where you're constantly aware, looking at the details of your face. This is not, it's not a natural way to live. It's not an ideal way to live because you become heavily scrutinizing your face. You're constantly looking for the next thing. You become disappointed, disenchanted. You lose confidence because the aging process continues to happen. And sometimes you end up finding yourself even more upset and depressed over these changes. So in my opinion, when it comes to these bigger type of treatments like fillers, energy devices, threads, when you start to get down into that category and using a stronger tool to address these things and it fails, it leads to a lot of disappointment and a lot leads to you know, wanting to do even more and becoming more obsessive with the entire process. Not to mention that it changes our anatomic norms of what looks normal and what is you know, an expected effect of having it. So we see, start to see faces all changing and it almost becomes normalized that people are gonna have puffy cheeks and this and that. That's a danger. That's a unfortunate sort of like psychological bend that we, we start accepting those things, which is not ideal because we all know when we see it, it doesn't look right. All right, so let's be realistic now. So I've been, I was being very, very, you know, sort of thoughtful and fair to what is already out there. Although I, I, I don't know if you, maybe I wasn't being totally, um, <laughs> so totally nice to, to those other type of treatments, but I mean, I'm, I'm gonna tell it to you honestly, that's what I do. Um, but let's talk about it realistically. So remember in the beginning I said there's a, there's a division between skin and shape, right? I'm gonna say this right now. Things that affect shape, sagging tissue, there's literally nothing you can do to prevent that from happening. Nothing you can do to prevent that from happening. Tissues will sag, they're related directly to hormonal changes. It is 
fundamental to our sort of genetic blueprint that once you reach a certain age, usually for women it's around late 40s and early 50s, tissue is going to sag. Jawline's gonna get square, neck is gonna sag, eyes are gonna get heavier, and then from there it just gets worse. Simple. Simple but sad, but simple. But when it comes to skin, what does young skin look like? It's supple, it's thick, it's free of lines and wrinkles, it's free of discoloration, it's smooth to touch, it's bright and luminous, it's young, right? Young skin is 100% in your control, 100%. When you have young looking skin and young looking facial shape and they come together, you have a young person who looks as young as they feel. Now, simple best way to set your expectations in the right direction is know the sagging is gonna come at some point, but know that you can totally prevent facial skin aging by taking the right active measures. And if you do those things, then when the time comes to have a surgical procedure, the two pieces come together and you're back to looking very, very young. Even if you don't have a surgical procedure, maybe that's not in your cards and you don't wanna go down that road, if you don't have a, a facelift or something like that, at least by having the skin look really youthful, you're gonna feel a lot better. You start to feel worse when you start throwing money out the window and your face is starting to continue to age and sag and you didn't focus in the right way on the skin and next thing you know, you're in this situation where you're feeling like you've lost a lot of time, money, and you're disappointed, right? So we're gonna now turn the attention onto what I recommend, what I believe, is the right approach to prejuvenation, preventing facial aging from happening. Let's just start in the 20s and let's go forward because it really doesn't matter from that point forward. It's just all the way through, same recommendations. Number one, starting your 20s, go hardcore with sun protection. If you can be incredibly focused on broad spectrum sunblock, you know, mineral based, wear a hat, protect that skin, I'm telling you, best thing you could possibly do for yourself in the long run because it's an accumulation of the sun exposure and you know, even though the skin might look great in the 20s and 30s despite a lot of sun, it will start to answer back when the defense mechanism of the skin starts to break down in the 40s and 50s, that's when you start to see all the changes starting to come through and flood. So sun protection, number one priority. Number two, active skincare. This is exactly why I developed the trifecta because number one thing that you can do to prevent skin from aging is be focused on sun protection, but also start using actives on your skin. The things that I just mentioned, retinol, vitamin C, niacinamide, peptides, botanical lighteners, things that are going to improve hydration like hyaluronic acid, things are gonna improve oil balance like lipids, proper cleansing, all that stuff together will literally defy skin aging over time. Sun, active ingredients, and the third thing is consistency. Doing it consistently over your life. Being so proactive and being consistent that it just becomes part of your lifestyle. Because if you take a year or two or three break or flip flop from you know on and off, you're getting nowhere with this. Same thing with like diet and exercise. If you wanna keep a, a body that looks the same and is getting younger with age, you gotta focus on eating the right foods and exercising every day and seeing your body just transform in the right way. Skin is no different. Next is some other lifestyle aspects. Folks, sleeping well, eating well, eating a varied diet full of whole foods, antioxidants, you know, fruits, proteins, oils, all these things enhance the skin because the skin is literally just another organ. The better things you eat, the less processed foods you eat, the less sugar you eat, fried foods, it's gonna show on your skin. Smoking, major contributor to skin aging. Don't smoke, get away from shacking and nicotines and all that other, other stuff. Doing those things will definitely age the skin in a very, very accelerated way. I'm totally a fan of Botox. However, if you're taking good care of your skin, you'll be shocked at how little Botox you actually need because if your skin is nice and thick and not losing elasticity, then every time you crease and frown or whatever, that line is not breaking down the collagen and breaking down the skin to create a static line when you're not expressing because everyone, even in their 20s, expresses. They raise their forehead and you know, scrunch their eyes and do that. But as, as we get older and the skin thins and loses elasticity, those, that repetitiveness ends up creating a wrinkle. So if you can keep your skin healthy and young looking, then that isn't gonna happen. But by all means, 
Doing a little bit of Botox can just slow down this process significantly, really has very little long-term negative consequences as well. If you're younger and you're doing a little bit of filler, to augment, for example, a little bit of lips or augment a little bit of temple loss or a little bit under the eyes, totally fine. A little bit spaced over, you know, a little bit one year, next time you go in is like a year, year and a half from then, you're not doing it regularly, and please stay away from injecting your cheeks, and please stay away from injecting your jawline. These are not areas where volume is ever lost during the aging process, so you're not doing any type of rejuvenation effect, you're just creating a cosmetic change that is going to bite you in the butt in the long run. A little bit of a filler in these areas, now I prefer fat transfer, I realize that not a lot of people do fat transfer, so the bottom line is don't overdo fillers, and don't have the expectation that you're gonna have any impact on sagging, so it really is an ideal and, and most simple and appropriate way, and quite honestly, the most cost efficient way. Because think about all the things that I just said you don't need, lots of fillers, radio frequency devices, threads, all that kind of stuff. Just, I mean, you, all you have to do is do the math and see what that will cost you year after year after year for 10 years or more while you're you know, slow, trying to slow things down. You're wasting a lot of money. I mean, you will pay for a, a facelift, a vertical restore, whatever, you know, probably two times that in that period of time. It's crazy how much these things can end up costing, but they, they build up slowly over time. Each time, two or $3,000 a pop, two or $3,000 a pop, and then you're doing it on a regular basis. So keep that in mind as well. So guys, in conclusion, take care of your skin. Be consistent with it. If you're intimidated by the process of you know, trying to piece together a, a, uh, an appropriate routine, that's really what the trifecta was about. Check out our website to understand that a little bit. Be great with sun protection and be incredibly consistent because it doesn't matter if you're in your 20s or 30s, people who are in their 50s and 60s are getting benefit from, from taking care of their skin for the first time going forward. But trust me when I say this, it's the one thing that's in your control, just like your general health can be, just like your body can be, just like all these other things, that's in your control. And then just sit back, know that sagging is gonna happen at some point, and when it does, you have all those years to prepare for it and simply go in, have a procedure done if you, if you wish to improve that aspect, and then be done. And that way, you're not constantly chasing the next treatment, wondering when the filler is gonna go away, when is the next time you need to go for this, and go for that. It's just no way to live. That's such a complicated and self-aware way to live that it takes all the fun and joy out of life when you're always worried about that. This approach that I'm outlining for you, very simple, streamlined, do very little other than a little bit of work every night with your skin, skin and one surgery in your, you know, some point in your 50s or 60s, whatever the point is, and then you're done. Simple as that. Prejuvenation in a nutshell. I hope you guys enjoyed this. It's a fun topic, something I actually, I'm very, very passionate about. I care a lot about this because I think at the end of the day, I mean, this is a very sophisticated approach to, uh, to aging and in keeping people looking as young as they feel is really the, the most, uh, you know, the biggest blessing when it comes to what I can help you guide, guide you through. Um, if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to the channel. If you have any comments, drop them in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, please hit like and send it to some friends and family so they can enjoy it and learn um, from this topic. Like I said, there's tons and tons. I was shocked to see how much literature and information and videos and things like that are on this topic. I hope this is a very clean and clear perspective on prejuvenation. Thank you so much. Until next time, Dr. Mir Karam.